And, uh, the first speaker today is Professor Claude Bourgoyne from the Devos Eye Institute, Portland, USA. He's a well-known, worldwide well-known glaucoma clinician scientist, and his topic will be the Glaucoma Myopia OCT Phenotyping Consortium. Hello to Portland. Hello, Claude. Hello, Stefan. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in uh, this symposium. Um, I want to acknowledge that I'm a consultant with Heidelberg Engineering um, and as well have NIH funding that has uh, been pertinent uh, to the subject of this talk. Um, the ideas and the consortium itself are the result of more than 12 years of co collaboration with Bal Shahan. And I also want to acknowledge Gerhard Zinser, without whose commitment uh, to this large body of work, um, it would not have been possible. Let me start by saying just a few words about myopic structural alteration. We know uh, that myopia involves a very essential component of scleral remodeling and axial elongation of the eye. It's been our working hypothesis that myopic scleral remodeling and myopic optic nerve head remodeling are linked. and that ultimately we must determine how myopic a given optic nerve head and posterior pole is before you can detect glaucomatous alterations with the highest levels of sensitivity and specificity. However, in the year 2020, myopia is still ordered or staged using refractive error and axial length. There is no vocabulary or science to characterize how myopic a given optic nerve head is. The defining components of myopic alteration have not been identified and parameterized. We propose that progressive temporal displacement of Brooks membrane opening, which from now on I will refer to as BMO, and its delineated points and images will be read relative to the anterior scleral canal opening, which I'll refer to as the ASCO, and it will be blue. Enlargement and ovalization of these openings and posterior bowing of the peripapillary sclera are core components of the optic nerve head manifestations of axial myopia that can be used to characterize the phenotype of myopic alteration within a given optic nerve head. We further propose that the same phenomenon underlie the increased susceptibility of the highly myopic optic nerve head to glaucomatous damage at all levels of intraocular pressure. So what do I mean by temporal displacement of BMO relative to ASCO? Well, one of the earliest descriptions of this was in a paper by Tai Wu Kim, just based on clinical photograph, no OCT anatomy included, in which in children that were developing high myopia, they followed with clinical photographs and probably were identifying Brooks membrane opening although we don't have OCT of this particular eye from this paper, expanding temporally and shifting relative to the anterior scleral canal opening. They schematically depicted this um, as a shift um, of the sclera and Brooks membrane opening, but um, it was a schematic depiction and the actual anatomy could not be understood from those clinical photographs. This is a highly myopic in which the Brooks membrane opening points from 48 OCT radial B scans have been delineated relative to the anterior scleral canal opening points. You can see that within a single B scan here. And you can see that the Brooks membrane opening is temporarily displaced relative to the anterior scleral canal opening. Um, and um, when this happens, the more offset it is, the actual passageway of the axons through the sclera becomes much more oval and actually much more oblique. This is a depiction of this within healthy control eyes, which we define at present conventionally as having less than six diopters of myopia and progressively increases within eyes that are highly myopic. So let me tell you a little bit about the consortium that has been formed uh, in order to uh, hopefully expand our understanding of the interaction between myopia and glaucoma. Um, this now involves more, will involve more than 20 sites. 
um, pre-existing sites that contributed to the normative databases that I will tell you about, um, as well as the new databases uh, that I'll also explain. There are four principal goals. First is to characterize OCT structural normality in an unprecedented group of non-highly myopic healthy eyes. Second is to improve the detection of non-highly myopic early structural glaucoma to improve the detection of myopic structural abnormality and myopic structural glaucoma. And finally, to lay a foundation for artificial intelligence and deep learning data sharing among the larger family of Heidelberg engineering researchers and users. The normative databases are as follows, some of which have been published, including a Japanese, a European descent, and a Brazilian normative database that was acquired independent of engineering by Camilla Zangali and colleagues, but used all of the same principles. There is an American Hispanic ethnicity and African descent data sets that are close to completion, and a Chinese normative database uh, is planned. In addition, the the Caucasian normative database has been expanded to include representative ethnic composition of the US for FDA approval. And this is the database of 362 subjects that is currently on the instrument in the US. The Glaucoma Myopia Phenotyping Consortium will acquire three new data sets. First, highly myopic without glaucoma of 360 subjects, highly myopic with glaucoma of 360 subjects, and third, a non-highly myopic early glaucoma, which we will define as less than four diopter, four decibels uh, of uh, mean defect on visual field. These 13, uh, these new data sets will be acquired in two Chinese um, locations, Hong Kong and Beijing, in two Japanese locations, Tokyo and Kanazawa, two Korean locations, Seoul and Busan, two Hispanic ethnicity data uh, locations, Los Los Angeles and San Diego, to African descent, Birmingham and New York, and three European descent locations, Erlingen, Halifax, important by a uh, really distinguished group of investigators. The two highly myopic data sets will each span from an axial length 24 to 30 millimeters and equally sample the ethnic groups that I have mentioned. The non-highly myopic early glaucoma group will span the same age range as the existing normative database and will again equally sample the various uh, ethnic uh, groups uh, that I have explained. The initial OCT data sets, what I will now refer to as legacy OCT data sets, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, will be acquired. But the exciting addition will be the next generation spectralis which with high speeds that will allow additional isotropic grid scans of the posterior pole, including angiography, uh, to be acquired. And the anterion will be used for a full anterior chamber assessment and axial length measurement. The status right now is an ongoing organizational planning uh, within Heidelberg and amongst the consortium members. Imaging and data sharing technology is in development that will, that will be required for this endeavor and to include the larger group of Heidelberg researchers. An estimated data acquisition currently will occur in late 2021. So having said that, let me spend the rest of the talk just going through some of the concepts and parameterization strategies we have already published or are contemplating. And start, these start by characterizing normal aging, mostly within the FDA mixed ethnicity normative database, but also within the Japanese and the Brazilian data sets, in which minimum rim width and peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer thickness in circle scans have been characterized and reported. Laminar depth within the FDA normative database, the expanded database, has been characterized relative to four different reference planes. A parameter that we call ASCO BMO offset, which I'm going to explain to you as follows. This is data for an individual eye, a schematic depiction, Brooks membrane opening, 
points have been fitted with a curve. Their centroid is located at the origin within the BMO reference plane. This allows us to plot the direction of the neural canal. Here, for all 362 eyes, each data point is the ASOCO centroid relative to the BMO centroid, which is at uh, the offset. You can see <clears throat> its actual anatomy depicted here. You can tell from this that the majority of eyes have the neural canal passing through the uh, sclera uh, heading towards the superior nasal quadrant. And there's a pause here. We've also characterized peripapillary choroidal thickness and peripapillary scleral bowing, in which for which we use two parameters, peripapillary scleral slope or the slope of the immediate peripapillary and I'm just going to go back. And the depth of the ASCO relative to a peripheral um, scleral reference plane. These are the data for the slope measurements, and these are the data for global depth of the ASCO that plotted relative to age. And you can see that even in non highly myopic normal eyes, there is a very substantial increase in bowing of the peripapillary sclera in aged eyes. I'm afraid there's a pause here. The macular thickness has been characterized within um, the Caucasian normative database and continuous thickness maps, mapping strategies are under development. Um, and I think that uh, Don Hood and Christian Martin, um, who are members of the GMOPC and who will be following me will address these issues in greater detail. So in terms of detecting structural abnormality and structural glaucoma, many groups and many studies have reported the performance of MRW and peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer thickness for detecting glaucoma and alterations in glaucoma, glaucoma suspect eyes. And here I am just showing you our strategy uh, recently published for topoglobin topographically correspondent detection using both MRW and peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer, which achieve high levels of sensitivity and specificity. And the idea for us is to show and build strategies that show actual anatomy of the nerve head in the peripapillary nerve fiber layer <clears throat> displayed relative to large normative databases in a topographically correspondent and clinically intuitive manner that extends from the optic nerve head through the peripapillary uh, retina into the macula, in which initially structure function correlation will be required, but essentially and eventually will not. We'll be able to detect glaucomatous structural alterations using OCT anatomy alone. Finally, we've begun to push our work into highly myopic eyes. And I'll just show you some data from recent studies on, again, the, the offset of the anterior scleral canal opening in a subset of the normal eyes that are now depicted using green. These are aged matched to a group of highly myopic eyes with glaucoma in red and highly myopic eyes without glaucoma. And you can see that the yellow and red points generally are further offset relative to the, to the non-highly myopic eyes, but there is overlap. And in this instance, glaucoma eyes are not separated by this parameter significantly from the non-glaucoma eyes, although this is a very small early sample. But peripapillary scleral bowing also increases in highly myopic eyes. This is the depth parameter. Now the normals are in blue. And I'm sorry that <coughs> uh, moved ahead. Let me just finish that point on that slide. You can also see myopic eye bowing is generally larger than the normals, although there's overlap. And in this instance, there was significantly more bowing in the highly myopic eyes with glaucoma compared to those without. Continuous thickness strategies in the macula are being developed. This is a strategy by Jin Wu Jung, who's um, in uh, Seoul, Korea, also one of the GMO PC members. And I also know, uh, I, I believe that Don uh, Hood and Christian Martin will be talking about their own strategies for doing this, um, both in non-highly myopic and perhaps highly myopic eyes as well. 
So in summary, I've, I've talked a little bit about myopic structural alteration, introduced what we call the GMOPC that we hope will address this and it have um, uh, shared with you some of our initial strategies for parameterization of these eyes. Thank you very much. Um, once underway, we're hoping um, that we'll be able to expand this consortium to include many other uh, of our research family in Heidelberg Engineering. And I want to finally uh, acknowledge again my consortium colleagues uh, without whom this endeavor would not be possible. Thank you for your attention and for the invitation to present um, uh, on this subject. Thank you so much, Claude, uh, for this uh, insight into the consortium's work. And uh, here are your questions. First question is, thank you for this cool talk. How much corneal curvature would affect GMPE measurements in high myops? Um, so we are um, right now, uh, we are gathering information from many groups. Um, as many groups as we can about the degree of astigmatism um, in um, highly myopic eyes and whether we need to develop um, exclusion criteria and limit astigmatism to less than um, two diopters of astigmatism. Um, so I, I, I give you that answer to acknowledge that corneal curvature may contribute and make it difficult um, and in this initial group of myopic eyes, we, we are forced um, to limit the amount of myopic pathology that we characterize because it's an unknown. This is, a, this is really um, going to be challenging for us. We think we need to bite off an amount of high myopia that we can understand and parameterize initially and then gradually move um, into more myopic. But the, the challenge for us now is, what do we mean by more myopic? Diopters and axial length are not enough. And, and the beauty of our field is we have the anatomy now. And we have a company that's committed to this challenge, which I'm very excited about. Thank you, Claude. And a very practical question, but. Fair enough. One person says, why 360 subjects and not 400 or 300? How, what's the rationale be behind that number? So um, these, uh, um, the rationale is the, is the kind of power estimates that are done for major grant applications. Um, it is, um, they are based on how much very how much variation in the anatomy you expect to see and how much um, data there is to support um, broadly you need to sample that variance in order to have reasonably tight 95 percent confidence intervals and um, of course there's been a lot of compromise as well ideally you'd like to have thousands of subjects in these normative databases um, what we chose 360 as an estimate of, uh, uh, as a first estimate of being able to capture enough of the variance in these eyes and still have tight enough confidence intervals for the upper and lower fifth percentiles uh, to make them clinically valuable. Thank you, Claude, and uh, thank you to Portland, Oregon. I personally have been there, and it's always a nice place to go. And uh, um, I wish you all the best for, for that project, or, or us, so to speak. And thank you for your talk, and we move on. from.